right where the candle, where the light was, real big letters with his own finger he wrote. Mene, Mene, Tekel, you farson. And the bottom line is, is Belshazzar, you're in trouble. This is it. We're done. I'm through. This very night, not only will your life be taken from you, but he said your kingdom will be divided. I'm talking about God. Your kingdom will be divided and given into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. Little did he know the very moment that he got those cups already, they were coming in under the Euphrates River, underneath the wall, and coming up under the moat. They snuck in, and they were coming in to kill him as he was praising other gods. My heart grieves for the lost. God said they're out of step. They're out of the way. God told me, he said, son, he said, I want you to tell my church that their way is hard. Sometimes you may think that the way that we live is hard because we're persecuted, but it's, that's nothing compared to the glory that be revealed in us one day when you and I stand before the one that's in glory. But their way is hard. The Bible says that the way of a transgressor is hard. God said their way is slippery, which means they're out of their, their feet. They, they can't find solid ground. They're not on the right foundation. The Bible says, like I've said earlier, their heart has been hardened and, and they're, they're far away from God. They don't know God like you and I know God. You know, I remember one time, of course, it wasn't this way in the Bible. I was watching in the way the movie, but I remember after Peter had failed him and, and they were giving Peter a hard time. Peter looked at all of the disciples and said, but they knew him. He said, he, Peter said, yes, I failed him. But I know he's forgiven me because he was quick to repent. The wicked never repent. They'll tell you that, they'll tell God, they'll give him lip service and say, I'm sorry, and go right back out and continue doing the exact same thing they did. And they're in the church and they're outside the church. I know a lot of people. And I try to explain to them how that God has set boundaries for us. And I don't know if they think that it's not any fun to live for God or if the devil's lied to them, but these boundaries have been set because if we get outside those boundaries, God knows what can happen to us. We could be destroyed. That's why God sets boundaries for all of us. I don't care what your age is, I don't care who you are. Okay, what title you have after your name? Thank God that God's got a boundary up about us. But yet God said to me that the wicked, that their way is crooked. And what that means is this what I told you, is number one, they don't have any boundaries, no inhibitions. And wide is their gate, the Bible says, and broad is their way. That's why they're out of step. They're not on the straight path. They're not going to the straight gate on the narrow path. They're not on that path. They're on another path. And it has nothing to do whether you come to church or not. Don't be deceived. The devil, the Bible says in the last days, do not be deceived. Deception will be rampant. The Bible talks about the coin that was lost in the house. There's people right here in the house that are lost because of this very word that I'm preaching. It's not because that they don't know God. Everybody has a knowledge of God, but they don't have a relationship with God. Gabriel asked me a question today about one of his friends. His name's Mason. He said, Daddy... And I thought it was up on it just to confirm my man. He said, Daddy, do you know Mason? I said, I don't know him, but I know of him. See, there's a lot of people in here that know of God. Oh, let me preach, but they don't know him. You know him this morning, or do you know of him? There is a big difference between the two. The wicked will tell you, I know of him, but I want you to know that's not enough. God said to tell the church today, but do you know me? Do I know you? Are you in a relationship with me? You better think about that this morning. I said, what are you marching for? The only thing that's going to matter is are you born again? 
Look at me. Are you saved? Are you ready? Are you the real this morning? Or are you fake? Are you living right or are you living wrong? Are you living the truth or are you living in error? That's what God wants me to ask you this morning. And that's why you have to examine your heart, not me. All I can do is tell you what God... It's up to you because it's all about choice. You know, last week y'all were shouting me down, but it's quiet in here today. Because there's conviction here today. And there's a lot of times that the wicked, they'll be under so much conviction. And I believe that this very night even so, I believe that Belshazzar was under conviction. I believe that by faith. But he had to have something to water it down, didn't he? God revealed this to me last night as I was watching this. Do you think I'm happy that he died and went to a burning hell? No. Do you think God is? No. But have you ever noticed, I was thinking about something that Josh said the other day. Have you ever noticed when you start to get in where people really live, they said, are you trying to judge me? I heard that more time. And my point is, they're just trying to water it down, God said. If you water down conviction, Nobody may see it, but God sees it. It looks good. It, it sounds religious. Sounds holy sometimes even. And that's what he did. He began to drink it away. He began to smoke it away. He began to, to uh, just whatever he could to, to push this conviction, which conviction's a good thing. Let me tell you what. Conviction is the love of God drawing you to him. Nobody explains anymore really what it is, but I understand because I was around some old time saints that taught me a long time ago. Conviction is a good thing. It draws, it's the love of God saying, come to me. I've seen people that have lived a terrible life in the church, including myself when I first, when I first got in. I did a lot of things I wish that I wouldn't have done, but God was teaching me. But it seemed like he poured out more mercy and more grace. It seemed like I just kind of went through it unscathed. And I, and I wondered why, Gillis. Now I know why. didn't mean I was right. It doesn't mean you're right. It just means that God is good. God will bring you through your mess. He's not going to kick you out for your mistakes. That's, that's not what this message is about. But you get to the point where you can harden your heart so much to the point that God, just like Samson, is God has departed from you and you don't even know it. The Bible says, God quicken me, I'm going to stop, I'm going to go back another way. Let's look at the life of Jezebel. Have you ever noticed that I, I've never in my life ever, I haven't, maybe you have, I've never seen anybody name their kid Jezebel. Have you? I don't know if you have, but I've not. Why is that, I wonder? Because she was the epitome of wickedness. She was the poster child for it, Jezebel, and above her was wicked. God called her wicked. The Bible said that when she died, the eunuchs threw her off the top balcony, and the Bible says that she was so wicked, the dogs came and ate her, remember? But have you noticed? There was two things not even the dogs would eat. They wouldn't eat her hands, and they wouldn't eat her feet. Why? Because she was so wicked. Jesus talked about the wicked being isolated. When a, when a person isolates themselves from the church, listen, and from God, there's a reason for that. When they begin to isolate themselves from those that are there to help them, you know, I'm here not to hurt you, I'm here to help you. I'm here to point you to God. I, I, you know what, I was in here a long time ago and I was worshiping God. And I've told this, I want to tell it again. And I was worshiping God and we were having a great worship service. And the first time in my life that I'd ever have a, a, an open vision in the church like this, and it's been, it's been about three or four years ago, I was standing right here and all of a sudden, you know how you used to go with them big drive-ins with your sweetheart when you were young? Them great big huge drive-ins, you'd sit out there and you see that big white screen. I'm looking at a drive-in with a great big white screen and I'm seeing a dog. Most beautiful dog, it was red, solid red. 
When I first saw him, he was just standing there, standing just perfect. And I was looking at him, and I got to see him there for a minute. I got to a good look at him. He was a red setter. He was Irish red setter, beautiful dog. The next thing that he did is I saw another vision, the same screen, and this time he's pointing. You ever seen a bird dog when he's pointing out a covey or he's pointing out a grouse or he's pointing out something that he's after? He's done smelled it out, and he'll get up on both of his legs like his tail goes bing, straight out, and he's up and he's pointing. And my vision cut off. Well, you know, your preacher don't know everything. God started laughing. I said, God, is there a dog in the church? He starts laughing. He said, no, son, ain't no dog in the church. I said, God, what does that mean? He said, Mark, he said, point him to me, son. He said, point him to me. That's what I'm doing right now. See, today is definitely not the message that I would have chosen to preach to the church. This is not the message that, that I would have wanted to preach. I probably would have come here inside to preach, jump, shout, run. But this is what God, and I've been doing this a long time. See, when you're isolated from God, there's two things that happen. You're isolated when you're wicked. And number two, you don't truly know what life is all about. But I understand one thing. I've been given a second chance at this thing, man. I've been given a second off. I've been raised up basically from my deathbed and given another opportunity to share this gospel. He kept me here because I'm going to tell people. That's why I'm a big mouth. i got a big mouth. And, I, and when I was a kid, people used to tell me, man, you talk all the time. Well, one time I couldn't talk at all. Do you all know that? One time I, I didn't ever want to talk. I would stay away from people. You know why? Because I couldn't speak right. People made fun of me all the time. Made fun, you know, I know of you don't know this. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak correctly. I couldn't say my words correctly. And all they laughed at me and made fun of me. But I was such a great athlete, I'd take it out of them. I'd beat them up on the... On, I was a mean kid. I'd beat them up after I'd remember what... I'd throw them into trees and knock them down in the dirt. I was a mean kid when I was in the fifth and sixth grade, man. And, you know, and, and that's all we wanted to do, you know. But they, a lot of them were laughing at me, making fun of me. But I was a really good athlete, man. I'd just take it out of them on the football field or basketball court, especially on the kickball court, praise God. We, we'd beat them every time. But they would make fun of me. Because I couldn't pronounce my S's and I couldn't pronounce my C's for years and years. And I still, I can see this lady right now and she helped me. She helped me to speak. She helped me to be able to say words correctly. And she worked with me for years and years. And even in that classroom, we had competition. And I hated them people. That I, felt, I mean, I wasn't saved back then. They, 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 even people in that class would make fun of me. So I'd say, you know what? This competition day, I'm going to win the jelly bean. I'm going to win the candy bar. Whatever I've got to do to win. So we've all been given another chance at life. You've been given an opportunity today. To make the right choice. That's what God, this is what the, the great part of the message is, is the wicked's end is destruction and desolation. But if we make the right choice, our end is bliss and glory. And we're on our way to an eternal kingdom. God, when you were here today, Brother Bill, or somebody was talking, God said to me, you know, I've given you eternal life. And I just began to smile. That's why I went to the altar. I went to, I asked him to cleanse me. I asked, it convicted me. I said, God, cleanse me. You've given me everything. He's given us more than our heart's desire. Has he not? I feel the Holy Ghost. Come on, raise your hands and stand to your feet today. God wants you to know that all he wants us to do is surrender to him. He doesn't want our things. It's like a woman or a man. It, it's great that you can make things for him, give things to him. It's all part of it, but that's not really what they want. No, they want your attention. They want you. That's the way God is today. Look at me. He wants every, look at me up here, everybody. He wants you. He died for you and me. He gave us eternal life. He died for us. Years ago when I was in prayer one time, I never wanted to be a preacher. When I first got saved, I used to tell God, I said, God, I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I just want to, I was an intercessor. And he baptized me in the Holy Ghost. I was, I was traveling all over the place with my former pastor. He's going everywhere. Man, we pray. We go into a city. One time I went in the city. I stayed there three days before I even got there. And we prayed. I was hotel. I said, what? I took my break. I took my break. And I went and I prayed. I was in Cleveland, Tennessee. Right before a camp meeting, revival. T.L. Lowry, first time I ever met the man. One night I was in prayer. 
I'm more close. I want to.